welcome everybody. So nice to see familiar names and so nice to see people from many different countries. We've got Denmark, we've got Holland, we've got Colorado in the USA. Um, we've got Cape Town, South Africa, lots from Tanzania, lots from Kenya, a couple from New York City. Uh, really exciting. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, really appreciate, um, especially those who keep coming back to these sessions. We hope they're helpful, as Naji mentioned. And if you have a speaker recommendation or something you'd love to learn from, let us know. Um, and yeah, awesome. That being said, I'm so excited to chat with Sam today. Um, Sam has been somebody I've read about uh, on articles online. I've, I've seen quite a bit of his work, um, you know, and, and many different things in the tech space. He's actually somebody I've looked up to. He doesn't even know this, uh, but this is actually the first time we've actually spoken. So we actually just met a couple of minutes ago before this call. Uh, you know, I pinged him on WhatsApp and I was like, hey, we would love to have you on. Uh, and he, he kindly, graciously agreed to join us. So Sam Karibusana and welcome to the, our Build Af Africa speaker session. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Sam, you have a unique story. Um, and, and that story involves being abroad, right? And, and, and being at Morgan Stanley for nearly six years. Um, and you talk about this one trip that you came home to check out the tech ecosystem and what was going on out there and how that you know, trip inspired you to get more involved into building the tech ecosystem. Could you tell us a little bit more about that background and that story uh, so everybody can understand uh, where it all stemmed from? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, so, so I was um, born and raised in Kenya and, um, you know, had the good fortune of coming to school in the U.S. I'm actually in the U.S. at the moment. Um, nice. And, you know, and after college, I studied computer science um, and, you know, worked in New York for some time. Um, and during that time, I think I, I think one thing that I did that uh, that, I, that I think you know I look back to and I think that was important was you know, I just kept touch with the continent because what happens with a lot of people that come to the U.S. is you know you get absorbed in the U.S. way of life and you lose touch with the continent and and you know and then you end up you know building a life for yourself in the U.S. Um, but I was lucky enough to you know take part in a couple of programs. So I was in MIT and we had a few programs where you'd you know, send students back to Africa to teach programming. So I taught programming in Ghana. Uh, then I did my thesis on actually like APIs for um, connecting devices in Africa to do experiments, uh, devices in MIT to students in Africa to do experiments remotely. Um, so I, so I, did, I did that in Nigeria and I really loved my experience in Nigeria. I remember, you know, spending some time in, um, in, in, uh, in, in, in Western Nigeria, like, you know, just, just a great, great environment. Um, and then after that, um, uh, start, just kept touch with some of my colleagues who, you know, went to school with and, and one of them called Eston, moved back immediately. And, um, you know, so he spent some time uh, just doing different businesses on the continent. At that time, I was, I was living in New York, you know, enjoying life, you know, just, you know, not really thinking about coming back. Um, but then he, he just kept nagging me about, okay, you know, you, you should come back and do something on the continent. Um, so I remember this trip in 2010 when, you know, finally came back and by that time we had already incorporated, we hadn't incorporated Africa Stalking, but we had the domain name. Um, we actually just wanted to create a message board, uh, where people could just tell positive stories about Africa. Um, <clears throat> so I came down and there was three of us in the room and we were like, Hey, let's just incorporate. Let's, you know, let's turn this thing into a company. We didn't know what we were going to build. Um, so we're like, okay, let's just, you know, get the name. One of my friends dropped out. Um, so me and Eston, you know, just kind of split the company and we're like, okay, uh, now we have a company, let's build something. And, and that's where we started, you know, just experimenting with different ideas. Uh, the first idea we really went after was kind of like Alibaba. So e-commerce, um, and then that evolved into, uh, group lending, so kind of like Groupon, but then for Africa and then eventually found this big problem in the telecommunication space where um, no one really knew how to navigate uh, engaging telcos and getting services from them. And, um, and that, that was actually a big enough problem. And, you know, and I think the timing was right as well, uh, because once we built our solution, a lot of companies started to use our, our product. Um, and since then, we've just been kind of just going deeper into that space, going deeper into telecommunications and, um, and, and really understanding the telcos and uh, getting our routes across many different African countries. 
Sam, um, one thing I find, so a couple of things there that were really powerful gems that you shared. You know, one is uh, being abroad, right? So a large part of our audience or people tuning in today are, you know, a diaspora who live abroad or people interested in the continent who live abroad. And there's always this question we always get is like, okay, when do you know it's time to move back home? And you talked about uh, this idea of staying connected to the continent. Do you have any tips or advice for somebody who might be in a position where they're sitting at home right now watching this and saying like, hmm, I wonder what that is to, for me and how might I get involved with what's going on in the continent? Do you have any tips or advice for them? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, definitely build some roots, um, you know, find people that you trust that, um, and I'm not talking just family here, but people that are actually doing something on the continent that can expose you to, uh, you know, what, what is it, what is, what is it actually like to do business? What is it like to like, you know, uh, you know, build a team, um, you know, come back to the continent, see what's going on. Um, I think, and, and, and for me, I think the killer ideas really come in when you have that global exposure and then you try and solve a problem on the continent because there's inherent advantages to, you know, just looking at the continent from outside Africa and thinking about things at a Pan-African level um, and then coming back and executing on the ground. Um, so for me, the, I think my, my co-founder who, you know, came back right after college, so I spent some time in the U.S. and spent some time in Hong Kong as well, um, so he had an office, he had like three, four people that were already working there. Uh, he had the, the company incorporated. Um, we had the, the, uh, the license from the government. Uh, we had the agreement with Safaricom. So I wasn't walking into a complete, you know, like I have to start my own path, which can be really tough and challenging. So there's, there's you know, that soft landing that you, that you can build for yourself, even as you're not on the continent, um, but it takes effort and, and it takes, you know, just deliberate, you know, I want to move back, I want to do this um, and, you know, eventually plant some roots and then see where it takes you. I mean, for me, it actually, it took losing a job. Um, so I lost my job in Morgan Stanley and that's when I actually, I had to move back. Uh, but then thankfully I moved back onto some kind of platform where I could actually now build on top of it. Uh, and then the experience I had in the U.S., of building really large scale, very scalable systems that can handle, you know, millions of transactions translated very well to us the problem I was trying to solve on the continent, which was how do you aggregate across all these telcos and then route millions of messages every day um, in a way that the system is not gonna fail. So, so it's kind of like bringing that expertise that you've, that you've gained from working outside the continent and increasingly you can get that on the continent, but there's all this expertise that you gained from being outside that I think you can come back and really, you know, make a big impact uh, on the continent. Mm -hmm. Sam, speaking about problems, you've talked about how Africa's talking has evolved over time, right? You talked about messaging, you know, you talked about, you know, today it's an API platform that's available. So can you describe what type of problem Africa's talking is trying to solve today? Right. Yeah. So, so Africa's talking is, so we're solving, um, I guess, two big problems. So, so on the, so solving a big problem for businesses, uh, which is how do businesses engage their customers at scale um, in Africa, right? So if you have a business and let's say you have 10,000 farmers that want to use your solution, how do you engage those farmers at scale um, in a world where some of these farmers may have smartphones, some of them may have uh, you know, just basic phones that can only do USSD, can only do SMS. Uh, some of them may want to call you. Some of them may want to use mobile money to uh, engage with your platform. So how do you actually uh, engage with these customers at scale? Um, and so how do you do this? And then how do you scale this? And scale means uh, you're working with five telcos, you're working across five countries, you're working across uh, 10 different products. Like how do you actually scale that? Um, the second problem that we solve is for developers. Like how do developers build the solutions that can actually now orchestrate these engagements. Um, so the API is a big part of it. So the API makes it easy for developers to, with a few lines of code, add very powerful uh, engagement functions to their application. So uh, with a few lines of code, you can suddenly send an SMS to anyone on the continent um, and you can start receiving messages. You can start, you can build a USSD application, you can build a voice application. Um, so we also really looking at how do we lower the barriers even further um, and moving to this world where not only do you need to build an application, you need to start thinking about how do you scale it, where do you host it? So in countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, Egypt, you have to host your data locally. Um, so we, we're starting to look at how do we help developers in terms of how do they make sure that what they build scales, but then is also complying with what you need 
uh, to make sure that your application is actually viable in those markets you're trying to operate in. Um, so it's that kind of like, you know, solving the engagement problem for the business, uh, which is probably the most important activity for a business, like really getting your customers to know you and interact with your services. And then for developers, helping them, giving them better tools for building these applications that uh, can really operate at scale. Sam, it's, 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 been, it's been 10 years, right, since you probably moved back and, you know, probably lots of reflections going on as we head into 2021, lots of like, hey, these are some of the big lessons I've learned over the past couple of years. Uh, what are two things that stand out to you as you review and reflect uh, the past 10 years that, you know, if you were to share them as pieces of advice to an upcoming founder entrepreneur, what would you say they were, what they would be? Yeah, um, I think one, so, so yeah, so it's been 10 years building, I mean, 10 years is a long time. I don't think I've done anything for 10 years in my life, <laughs> including primary school. Um, so it's definitely been, you know, maybe the longest attachment I've had. Um, and for me, it's, it's more of, uh, it's just looking at each day as if it's a fresh start and then reevaluating constantly. So at Africa Stalking, we are always asking ourselves, uh, this question, like, what can we do today that we couldn't do yesterday? Um, so what what has come into our ecosystem or, you know, what connections have we made that now make it easier for us to do something that we couldn't do yesterday or, you know, a few days ago? Um, and that could be maybe we now have an integration into Tigo in Tanzania or we now have uh, an engineer who's joined that, you know, knows blockchain or we've jo- or we now have... Uh, we're now part of the Endeavor Network, which is this global entrepreneur network, or uh, what, is, what is it that we get every day that really helps us uh, scale? Uh, and for me, that's, thinking about it like that means that it doesn't, it doesn't feel like 10, it doesn't feel like you're running, you're running out of time. It feels like the time you're putting in is actually building something bigger and bigger constantly. And for me, that's very exciting. It, it, keeps, it wakes me up in the morning and I'm like, you know, it's been 10 years, but I want to I wanna keep doing this because there's a new universe that's opened up because of ABC. So right now I'm in the U.S., for example, and there's opportunities opening up where we could actually even go global, uh, where you could start selling your products to the U.S. and other markets because of new connections that you now have that we can now form. So for me, that's exciting. Um, the other thing for me is really, uh, it's, it's really about finding focus in the business. Like, what do you want to anchor your business uh, against? Because you, there's so many distractions. I mean, I'm sure even, you know, building Nala, there's... There's probably like 10 different things that you could be doing, but, uh, but then there's, there's always that, what do you come back to? Like, what is that mm-hmm. true not for the business? Um, and, and for me, I, I, I really think if you anchor that on which customer are you chasing, like who is that, who is that person that uh, every day you're trying to make their lives better, their lives easier. Um, and, and I think we've been doing that for the last, I'd say six, seven years. We really focused on what is the developer's experience? Um, <clears throat> And we see many companies do it as a side, you know, side hustle. Like we have this core business and, you know, and we, you know, we have some APIs for developers, but very few businesses really look at developers as the heart or, you know, the guys who bring the money that like, this is, this is our customer. It's not even the business they represent, they represent it's the developer himself. Um, and for me, that has been very eye opening and rewarding because that allows us to go very deep in terms of just thinking outside the box in terms of, uh, what does it take for a developer to build something? What does it take for them to scale something? Um, and really, if we get new resources, like how do we deploy them to just really make developers much more productive and allow them to solve bigger problems, allow them to scale better, allow them to take more advantage of any connections that we have. Um, so for me, finding that focus is very important and it helps you as a founder lead because um, you become very consistent and people people even almost know what you're going to, how you're going to react to certain situations uh, because they're not second guessing. They're not really, uh, you know, thinking that you're going to go in five different directions. It's very clear that at the end of the day, this is your constituency. This is who you're serving. And um, mm-hmm. yeah. And I'm a developer myself. So, you know, so there's kind of that inception. <laughs> <laughs> for, for sure. I bet. I bet. Um, Sam, you probably come across a lot of developers. I mean, with your work, right? You probably are always like, hey, how can we improve this API? What else can we do better? Like, okay, you know, is there any latency issues with like calling these APIs for us? And um, you've probably seen developers across many countries in Africa, right? And so I think I saw a study recently, it says like Nigeria has the most developers in Africa, like by relative number count. And then like South Africa, Egypt was also pretty up there. Um, 
what do you think are some of the challenges developers in Africa face? Like, you know, if somebody's tuning in right now and say like, hey, I studied, you know, art in high school and, and university or whatever, and I want to get into software development. Do you have any advice for them transitioning their career into this? And what does that look like? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think the, you know, we definitely have a very vibrant, um, you know, you know, developer ecosystem. And, and this has really changed in the last few years, I think with companies like Candela coming in and uh, even now global mm-hmm. companies like Microsoft, Google coming in and investing in, you know, having their, having actual development work being done on the continent. I think mm-hmm. Amazon has been in Cape Town for a long time. So they really helped that ecosystem. Um, so, you know, so mm-hmm. the challenge of where do you find a place where you can really practice your skill? I think that's being solved, but that's one of the big challenges. Um, mm-hmm. One thing that for me was very helpful was um, just having the right mentorship. And, and I think that's where we really, mm-hmm. we don't have those, you know, developers who've done this for like 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Um, right. And those were my mentors when I was in my 20s, I, you know, in Morgan wow. Stanley, I had, okay, I'm quite old for those in the audience. <laughs> um, so, we, so we actually, so I had this these two Russian guys and um, I, mm-hmm. I was working with in Morgan Stanley. And these guys were fantastic mm-hmm. engineers. I mean, the guy would, they'd write like two lines of code that really changed wow. the entire <laughs> memory model. I mean, this is just that kind of mentorship. And they were very patient with me. I mean, they could see that I, I didn't, I wasn't where I needed to be. And they gave mm-hmm. me time and they taught me, they reviewed my code. Um, and that really is lacking on the continent. I mean, you, you find a lot of the developers probably started mm-hmm. practicing three, four, five years ago. And then you find that the guys who are there, the kind of the OGs are heading towards management and leadership and all this. And I feel like, I really feel like we need to build that crop of, you know, veterans Mm -hmm. who've done this for a really long time, or maybe import veterans who can come in and really nurture and, uh, and, and grow that. And, and for me, if I was not doing what I'm doing at Africa Stocking, I think that's what I'd be doing, you know, full time, like really, Mm -hmm. you know, how do we, how do we just go deep technically? Like, I was writing code just before this call. I mean, I, I've been writing code since 2001 and I haven't looked back. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, and for me, that's how, how do you get to that level where you deeply understand these concepts? Mm-hmm. Because for me, that's where when you become that good um, and you have that crop of guys who are really that good, um, I think mm-hmm. it can really do wonders for, for, um, for just nurturing the young talent on the continent. Um, are there, are there, you know, I know there's a lot of developer communities online. Does Africa's Talking provide one that's, you know, to, to mentor uh, like different developers right now or not yet? Or is that something you'd like to do soon? So, so yeah, so we actually, we do a lot for the developer ecosystem. So we, we mm-hmm. usually, we don't have our own community. What we do is we, uh, we build other communities. Uh, for example, we, uh, we helped build For Loop, uh, which came out of Nigeria and, you know, and has been one of the largest communities. Uh, we do, we've been working closely with different uh, language groups, so like uh, uh, the JVM group, uh, JavaScript, so all these different groups. Um, so we really help catalyze that. Um, and I think one of the first African companies that if you went to a developer event, let's say in a random university, you'd find us there. And, you know, it was us and then Intel and Google and all these other guys. But then, um, you know, we really wanted to champion that developer first, that mentality of let's create for developers. Um, and for me, what's encouraging is seeing many other companies now doing the same thing. Um, so looking at uh, even telco. So Safaricom releasing APIs, Vodacom in Tanzania releasing APIs, MTN releasing APIs, um, you know, just seeing banks releasing APIs, people opening up and really mm-hmm. valuing the developer as someone that can create value. Um, mm-hmm. For me, that's, I, that's, my work is almost done. I mean, because you can't do it alone. And it's, it's also good to see guys like Google investing in spaces in Nigeria right. and Microsoft in Kenya, Lagos. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, there's a movement and there's a lot of momentum to it. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's a good thing. And, and Sam, um, you've seen the ecosystem develop over the last 10 years, right? You were there yeah. early days in Nairobi when iHub was probably just starting out. You had the Copo Copos being built out then. Um, and so you've seen it evolve over time, right? And, and you see all these data and reports about, okay, um, you know, there's all these people saying like, okay, it's never been easier to start a tech company in Africa, but it's also never been harder to make it massively successful, right? Especially at scale. Now yeah. you guys have scaled to over 10 countries. Um, what was the secret sauce with scaling? I know you talked a little bit about 
the issues you had in different countries yeah. with building data centers locally. Uh, but what are some of the biggest challenges you guys face with scaling a, a Pan-African technology business in, in, on the continent? Yeah, um, I think with scaling for us, we, we, just, we just did it. I mean, we, we just decided one day, one day we were in Kenya and then one day we were like, hey, let's go to Uganda, let's do this. Let's incorporate in Nigeria. Let's, and then we, we, had, we started scaling when we were very clear on who our customer, what's our focus, who is our customer. Mm-hmm. So anytime we got into a market, it was very clear who we were going after. It was a developer. It was, you know, let's find the hub. Mm-hmm. Let's find the guys who are in the ecosystem. So there was no confusion around, do we need 100 people? It's like we need one or two people that can actually evangelize our product within the ecosystem. Um, so Africa is a vast continent. And, and some of the lessons we are now learning, and perhaps we probably scale too fast and, you know, and spread ourselves a bit too thin. Um, mm-hmm. But then now what we are starting to do is look at it from a hub and spoke approach. So uh, mm-hmm. instead of looking at every market and trying to get into every market, why not get into the markets that have a significant developer ecosystem. So looking at, you know, mm-hmm. let's get into Nigeria. You know, we've done well in Nigeria. We, you know, we have a mm-hmm. good brand, we, you know, we're getting customers. So let's build mm-hmm. that up and let that be the hub that now gets us into Ghana, uh, Cameroon, mm-hmm. like the surrounding markets. Let's build South Africa, let's build Egypt. Um, so you also kind of have to see, should I divide and conquer? And I don't know if that's gonna work. I mean, that's what we're doing right. now. But is it going to work? It's going to be like two years later, you're like, oh, my God. I mean, there was no, <laughs> there are no synergies between Egypt and the rest of North Africa or, right. uh, you know, Nigeria is kind of like its own thing. And maybe Ghana is a better place. Uh, but for me, yeah. that seems like a much more scalable approach, because once you start getting into more markets, um, it's costly and not just in terms of money. It's costly in terms of just the leadership time, like the mind, the mind share it takes to really solve a problem that's going on in uh, in Malawi, a problem that's going on in Uganda or a telco that's now shutting mm-hmm. you down in Nigeria or, you know, so, so these things just multiply <laughs> and multiply. Um, and if you right. go in and you don't have a very cost effective way of becoming profitable, the good thing is we've been able mm-hmm. to become profitable in many of these countries because, you know, we're very cost efficient. We're very focused on how we're going in. Uh, but if you're just going mm-hmm. in, you know, spray and pray, you could get burned um, if you try and, and, and run too fast. Um, so, you yeah. mm. that, know. That's, that's really good advice because, like, you know, a lot of, especially when you're venture back, people expect scale, right? And um, exactly, that's yeah. something yeah. that a lot of people don't understand and recognize. It's like, okay, no, you've taken venture back money. Uh, now you need to scale and build this up at a point where, you know, it's a massively profitable business. Um, Sam, I want to uh, understand something really well. So, you've been able to go on and raise uh, venture funding here. Um, but before we get into discussing funding, one thing I'd love to understand is you probably come across many developers that say like, hey, Sam, I have this amazing idea, uh, but I don't have any capital. Um, it's a question that we get often on our sessions. We're like, no, well, like I have all these ideas. If only I got the capital Sam got, I would have been, I would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, what advice do you have for people um, who might you know, have that perspective today? Uh, what advice do you have from them, even from a mentorship perspective? Yeah, I mean, we we didn't take capital until you know 2000 and I mean 2018, which was eight years into the business. Um, wow! And the big thing is, if you, instead of looking for capital, look for customers. Um, you know, and and the good thing with tech is, if you have a laptop, you can create you can create anything. I mean, you can create the next. You can create mm-hmm. an ally. You, like you can really build something. Um, so you don't need mm-hmm. that heavy upfront investment that's mm-hmm. going to eat into your capital. Um, so mm-hmm. if you find customers, because customers are always going to be your cheapest source of capital. If you go to a bank, they'll ask you for, you know, interest for like your title deed. If you go to, you know, the venture capitals, capitalists, they'll ask you for, you know, we, we want to sit on your board. Uh, we want shareholding. They want ownership. Mm-hmm. Your customers give you money and they don't ask you. They just mm-hmm. need your product. Um, and there's no better validation than that. And then once you start mm-hmm. building that customer base, the funding will come um, because wow. all these guys who are funding businesses, they are only interested in, you know, how do they make money? How do they get into something that's growing and that's going to give them, you know, hefty returns in future? So if, you, if you're able to grow your customer base quickly, then there's every chance that you'll get the funding that you need to then really scale it up. Um, and then before you take funding, it's very important to know what's your true north, like what's your focus, like what are you actually, what problem are you solving? Because mm. 
if you're solving the wrong problem and funding comes in, then you're going to be stuck solving the wrong problem. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're clear that this is the right problem, this is a scalable problem, mm -hmm. I can build a large business on this, then by all means, go and, go, and, go and try and get funding. But if you're just sitting at home and you really, you know, it's just going to happen for you and the funding will come. Plus, there's a lot of guys who are probably, you know, out hustling you and trying to get that funding, then it becomes tricky. Uh, so for us, the reason we raised money, we were profitable, but then the, for the VCs, it was they want to be part of this growth story. I mean, they, we were growing really fast and, uh, and they wanted to be part of it. So that's why they came in. Um, and that's the best time to raise money when you don't even need it, but you're growing fast and you have customers. Um, and when they come in, you can now really leverage that. So we went from six countries to 18 countries, uh, you know, really increased our revenues, grew the team. Um, so the funding was really helpful, but we knew which dimensions we really wanted to grow along. Um, so, yeah. Wow, uh, that's amazing. Sam, I did not know that, it, you know, for eight years, you didn't take any funding. That's, that's a very impressive and almost unheard of nowadays, especially in the, you know, tech startup ecosystem. You see people starting out within their first year, they're raising like $500,000. And yeah. Sam's out here thinking, wow, these guys, if they only knew 10 years ago, <laughs> um, like how it was. No, that's, that's really admirable. I really respect that a lot because, um, you know, just that consistent focus on the customer and building and like, all right, let's make revenue. Let's hire more people. Let's grow uh, until getting to the state that you're receiving funding. So let's, let's talk about the funding piece, uh, Sam. Uh, you raised from some from quite some reputable uh, institutions across the globe, right? Uh, from the IFC to Orange Digital Ventures to to Social Capital, Shamas Fund. Um, you know, tell us about that journey. What was that like? And yeah, and then I have a follow up question to that. Yeah. Um, so we we didn't want to raise money. Actually, I mean, I you know <laughs> as, as much as money money seems to be you know it's flowing right now and it's good and mm -hmm. um and I, and I think that's good for the ecosystem and i have nothing against money um but mm -hmm. uh but then there was there was kind of this you're in control of your destiny and you know mm -hmm. you're profitable because mm -hmm. one thing people forget is when money comes in it doesn't change the dynamics of the market you know it, it mm -hmm. might help you execute faster but it doesn't change you know, the truth mm -hmm. about your product and your customers. Um, so if you have a product that customers don't like, money coming in is not going to change that. So we're mm -hmm. in that place where we're like, look, we have a product that customers want, companies are using it, many startups are our customers, you know, we're getting into enterprises. So why do we then need to, again, you know, layer this extra, mm -hmm. you know, burden, if you will, or like, why do we need this fuel? Um, so... One big reason why we raised money was, and those days actually, that was, and things have changed really fast. I mean, this was 2017, 2018. There was mm -hmm. no one raising money. I mean, there were very few mm -hmm. funds that were active on the continent. Um, and for us, it was, it was also a question of, okay, so how does this narrative start to change? Um, so, you know, so if we don't take this money, then some of these funds are probably not going to follow on. So IFC, who came in, mm -hmm. we were their first investment on the continent. ODV, Orange Digital Ventures, were their first investment. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, it was wow. also like, let's, let's see, since we can actually absorb this money, let's see if we can actually help, mm -hmm. you know, catalyze this movement where companies start to get funded. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, but I, I think one thing I really appreciate about fundraising is not even so much when the money comes in, it's the process of mm -hmm. articulating your business to an investor and distilling it mm -hmm. down to like, 10 slides that really tell someone to give you, give me $20 million because of these 10 slides. There's nothing mm -hmm. that, there's nothing more, you know, just helps you question everything <laughs> and yeah. reflect. Mm -hmm. And really, and, and, and right now we're actually in the middle of a round and, um, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, and one of the big reasons why we're doing it is let's just take a step back, let's take stock uh, and let's see, let's, how can we articulate where we are and how do we actually get someone who has never heard of us to suddenly write a big check uh, to, you know, to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, drive our growth. As for me, really appreciating that process. And even if you don't raise money mm -hmm. at the end of it, there's, there's much more clarity that you'll gain because you have to interrogate everything about your assumptions and, um, and then maybe even pivot and, and be like, you know what, this is just not big enough. Maybe I need to be doing that. Um, mm -hmm. And then getting that, just ruthless feedback, um, sometimes in the form of, yeah, this is great. And then, you know, you never hear from them again. Like this, that for me is really fantastic because it, it really helps you take a step back and really understand what, mm -hmm. why didn't I connect with that investor and, you know, what's going wrong. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I, I appreciate that process just for, for that sake. But um, if you're profitable and you feel like you can make it, do it. Um, and, you know, and, and for us, it's, we bring in investors when we're like, okay, now we, we feel like we've stumbled on a big enough opportunity that, uh, mm-hmm. and we think that we can get there faster with, uh, with, mm-hmm. with investors. Extra capital. Um, Sam, I would love to understand something. So, you know, sometimes when you go to fundraise, you show them a deck and like, hey, this is where we are today. This is our growth today. And this is where we think we're going to be in like three years or whatever, five years or 10 years, we're going to be a billion dollar company, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're always like presenting it, taking a step back, looking at the big picture. Um, and sometimes we're wrong, right? Sometimes yeah. like, hmm, like, you know, things change over time. Like, hmm, actually, like that, that's what happened for some of our, some of parts of our business as well. And we're like, oh, okay, actually this, the, what we were betting on, you know, this thing has evolved and this is where we need to pivot and change the business as well. Um, how's that happened for you guys? And, you know, how do you navigate that, especially with the team that's, all right, we're doing this and like, hey guys, or hey team, like actually we're switching gears. We're going to be focusing on this. How does, uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Has that happened to you guys at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the billion dollar stories, I mean, I, I don't think anyone believes them. Uh, <laughs> even the investors, I think, I think they'll just humor you and be like, yeah, that's great. And probably dig into other fundamentals. I think everyone right. presents this like hockey stick, you know, growth. And, growth yeah. um, and probably very few guys make it, um, you know, so. Uh, but then once, once you bring in the investors, one thing, um, no one is coming in to lose money. So if there's a mm-hmm. fundamental shift, that means that this is not going to work. I don't think investors will force you to go down that road just because that's what mm-hmm. you presented to them. It's, you know, they don't want to lose money. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, they want you to be that 10x company that really returns their fund. Um, mm-hmm. So it's actually not that difficult to like present a case and be like, you know, this is bigger, or this is better, or like this is not going to work. Um, mm-hmm. You definitely need to invest in building relations because once the investors come in, I mean, you mm-hmm. every decision will have to run by them. I mean, not mm-hmm. every meaning that every big directional move is probably need to mm-hmm. get, you probably need buying from them as well. Because suddenly, mm-hmm. you know, they, they're shareholders, they've put in a lot of money, uh, mm-hmm. they probably sit on your board. Um, so there's that, building that relationship so that when you do need to approach them with a certain, like if you're facing some difficulty or if something is not working, then you're not walking into a super hostile environment. You're walking into a friendly environment. Um, so, and I think that's been, that's been, that was a big challenge for us. Like really not having mm. being bootstrapped for eight years. And then, mm. you know, and being bootstrapped means the only authority you answer to is the government. I mean, there's, there's no one else that is really telling you what to do, going to like, suddenly you have this and, and you're talking IFC, you know, really like bureaucratic organization that is mm-hmm. very rigid and very like, you know, this, this has to be done this way. I think that was right. a huge learning curve for us. And I think that's one of the areas that we didn't do as well with venture money as, mm-hmm. we, as we probably would have with a bit more insight mm-hmm. into what it actually means to take in money. Because um, once you embrace that these are stakeholders, they're coming in and you have to work with them. I mean, they can really accelerate your business. Um, but that's just the reality. I mean, at some point, you know, they, they're, they're there and you have to, you know, you have to nurture that relationship. You have to build it up um, and you have to make sure that you keep them involved. Um, and that's how you take advantage of really having them as part of your cap table. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to pull in some questions here from the audience. Uh, and yeah, I know uh, lots of people uh, mentioned that they, they'd love to join in. So we have lots of people here. Actually, quite a lot of founders on this call I see here. I think there's like four or five YC back founders from Kenya who are on this call as well. So really cool to see that, uh, them joining as well. Um, we have a question here from David Rosenweig. David's based in New York City. Um, he mentions one of the things that excited me the most about this conversation was hearing about your initial experiences early on in the Kenyan entrepreneurial ecosystem and the development. I'm curious, uh, what are the three developments, I guess, that excite you the most in the Kenyan tech ecosystem? Um, so, so speaking about, I mean, when, when we started, it was, you know, there was, I mean, there was the IHUB and really nothing else. Um, yeah. So, you know, so, so I think there's been a lot of changes, um, you know, in, in the Kenyan ecosystem, I think one big mm-hmm. thing that that's, you know, that's been a big driver, I think for our business and for many businesses is just the mobile mm-hmm. money ecosystem. I think that's, you know, mm-hmm. that's a huge edge that many other countries don't have. Um, that ability mm-hmm. to 
accept payments from anyone. So anyone, mm-hmm. anyone walking around can be your customer because they can pay you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I think that's thanks to Safaricom and just regulation and, and just that huge enabling environment. That means that solutions mm-hmm. like micro lending or micro insurance or, you know, all mm-hmm. the ag tech uh, fintech solutions are quite possible in Kenya because you don't have to navigate 20 banks just to get paid. Um, mm-hmm. I think the, the other thing is just in terms of talent, initially it was really, for example, finding like a head of growth uh, mm-hmm. to drive a business, you know, three, four, five years ago was not possible. Mm-hmm. But then now and you've seen that even with Africa stalking where um, you have people come in, put in two, three, four mm-hmm. years and then go and do something big for another company. Mm-hmm. And over time that starts to build up and you start finding like there's actually a lot of talent that can mm-hmm. now, that now has the experience of, building and scaling a business. So if you walk in today and you want to build a team, it's not mm-hmm. hard to find people that you can actually, you know, bring in and really help you scale. Uh, and I think that's a big development that I think is, is quite helpful. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't want to really talk too much about funding just because, um, you know, I think mm-hmm. I, for me, funding is, is usually a signal of things going well. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, th- those two really that ease of just setting up a business and getting paid by customers as much as the government wants to tax you and all these things <laughs> the fact that you can get paid is that's a huge win um and you know and then that acceleration in terms of just the the kind of talent that we have i think those are pretty exciting uh, fun fact everybody when when the government ever uses uh, africa's talking services uh sam make sure they get a message sent back saying kra sinifate <laughs> Shadrach, uh, we, have, we have a question from Shadrach Kamenya here in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. What is the biggest challenge you have ever encountered during Morgan Stanley and Africa's Talking and how did you navigate through them? Uh, let's just talk about Africa's Talking. What, was, yeah. what has been, I'm sure there's tons. Uh, I'm sure there's lots every day as well, even today yeah. as we speak, even probably right now before this call. Um, and what's been like maybe one that stood out to you um, and, and you, you've thought about for a while? Yeah, I think the biggest one was actually, um, I think 20, 2019 was, 2020 for us was easier than 2019, believe it or not. Because mm-hmm. um, 2019 was that year of going from, because we went from 40 people to 100 and, I think 130 at some point in, wow. in a very short span of time. Um, and managing that growth um, from a people perspective was something I didn't know would be that difficult. Um, so, mm-hmm. so I went from this founder who was, you know, you know, you have you have your community, you have your, you know, right. your thirty guys, you squeeze <laughs> into a room, like this is my homies, yeah. <laughs> exactly, and 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 everyone is kind of like you know singing the same song, and um, yeah. there's a lot of you know just self drive, and mm-hmm. and then going from that to suddenly you have you've brought in like almost a hundred people and. Wow hell breaks loose and, mm-hmm. and and no one no one actually prepares you for that because mm-hmm. um you know it's not the kind of thing that happens over and over in the ecosystem so you can't you can't just say i'm mm-hmm. gonna hire the head of hr at x and mm-hmm. that's gonna solve the problem um so we had to like right. you know just get in and solve that problem and really think about what organizational structure because the reason why we had a re- we had a very good very good culture if mm-hmm. you will uh before the money came in um, and, you know, mm-hmm. it was very flat, very self-driven, and we wanted to keep that. And we thought we could keep that just by relying on people mm-hmm. to self-drive, but we didn't create the structures that allowed people mm-hmm. to do that. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that was one of those events that really, for about six months, there was a lot of just uncertainty around how is this going to end up. Um, and I, I wouldn't recommend any founder go through that. Um, I don't know what would have happened if we were also locked up in our houses during that time. Wow. Uh, I think that would have been a really tough uh, situation yeah. to navigate, but it helped that we could all kind of just be in the room and, and navigate that. But, um, but I think that was probably the most challenging uh, mm-hmm. you know, time. And big, biggest challenges usually come from people. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not anything else, yeah. it's people. And the company is about people. So um, you know, if you can get that part right, I think a lot of other things, you, either you will, either someone else in the team will solve it or, you know, we'll find some way to, you know, to get around mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Sam, I believe it was 2019 was the same year that you handed over your CEO role uh, and then to fully like run uh, AT Labs, Africa's Talking Labs. Yeah. Um, that is a difficult decision to do. That is very difficult for somebody to come and say like, all right, you know, this company I started, 
you know, you know, 10 years ago, whatever, uh, like carry this all the way to where it is today. And then now I'm handing over this role uh, to somebody else. Can you talk to a little bit more about that? Um, you know, can you share a little bit, how you, how do you know it was the right time to do this? You know, what, what went through the decision-making process for you as an individual when making this happen? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, so I'm, I'm still heavily involved in the business. Um, so it's not, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, tired of this. Um, I think for me, I, I usually look at companies and I think maybe it's from writing too much code, but I try and decompose <laughs> it into, um, you know, what's, I just thought about what's the most important instinct that the company needs right now. Um, and, you know, what's, what does Africa stocking need in 2019 versus what it needed in like 2015 or 2012. Um, so for example, I wasn't even, I was in the founding CEO. We had a founding CEO who was very, very experimental, very, you know, just, just out there, like willing to take risks and, you know, go to Nigeria, you know, set up the business. Like when there's, when I'm like, dude, like, what are we doing? So, and that's what we needed at the time. Cause that really created that spark. And then I came in and I'm a very product focused CEO. You know, I, I, I'm all about engineering product. Like how do we build this? How do we make sure this is the best system? Um, and that's what I'm good at. And that's what I enjoy doing. Uh, but then we got to that level where the business needed a different mindset. So we needed to, you know, make sure our operations are in order and our commercials are in order. And I'm not the kind of guy that will, that will get that done. Um, mm -hmm. So directionally, it was important for me to just signal that, look, the product is quite mature. I think we have a fairly mature product. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it works at scale. You know, it has, it's proven that it can actually deliver for customers. Um, right. So the big thing is who can now come and take that, take the business to that next space and really lead the company from a commercial perspective, from an operational perspective, which is all Bill her now came in to do. Like mm -hmm. she comes in and she has a very, she's not going to get in there in the weeds and build the product, but she's going to get in the weeds of operations, get in the weeds of mm -hmm. streamlining commercials and making sure that, you know, if we have a hundred people across Africa, things are not falling through the cracks. Um, and then for me, it was also, you know, just recognizing I, I have this, I believe people should, once you find what your, you know, what's, what's your, what's a unique arc of your genius, you know, to borrow a phrase, like what, mm -hmm. what, what are you uniquely good at, which is usually signified by what do you uniquely enjoy doing? And I enjoy writing software. I enjoy building stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So as a founder, I was like, okay, so do, do I want to get away from that? And, you know, and really now become what the business needs, which is a commercial lead, mm -hmm. an operational lead, or do I want to go deeper into building things and, um, and then maybe even help other people exploit what Africa Stocking has done um, to mm -hmm. create value for the ecosystem. So, so it's kind of like a win-win where, you know, I go to like get this space where I can keep building and, um, you know, and, and I think this year we we're probably going to start releasing some of the products we've been working on. Um, but, you know, at the same time, Africa's talking gets the leader that can really now solidify the gains and uh, ensure that we, you know, we execute 100% in ops and commercials. Awesome. Um, and, and I recognize and I, you know, give full respect on that. We saw recently a few days ago that Ken Jirogi of Celilant, um, you know, just recently stepped down from, from mm -hmm. his role, like it'll be transitioning out this year. And so um, it is quite something that's, that's tough to do. Uh, and, you know, full respect to being able to do that and transition the company to where it is today and now going on to hopefully raise a fully successful round. Um, we have a question coming in here from Weenie, I, be I believe who's based in the U.S. Uh, in hindsight, having gone through the 10 years journey, uh, what are perhaps the top three things you wish you'd know as, as a startup? Um, so top things I wish I don't, I, I wish, I think, I think a lot of what, um, so going back to kind of the big challenge of, uh, you know, just scale, like, like scale means all kinds of things. Um, and for me, that being very intentional about people is very important. Um, and I think that's become almost an obsession for me. So, you know, so we really thought about how do we create a people platform so that employees in Africa's talking are successful. Um, and, you know, and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's something that I think you might take for granted. You may think that commercial success will breed happy people and, and you're going to be fine. I mean, no, mm -hmm. it doesn't work like that. Um, I wish I'd known that every time when you triple the size of the business, 
everything breaks. I mean, <laughs> you don't fail. I mean, there is no, it doesn't matter whether you're Google or you're, you know, Africa stock, whoever you are, everything is right. going to break and you're going to, you, there's going to be a lot of drama that's going to ensue and you need to be ready for that fight. Um, I think the focus thing for us came a bit late. So we didn't really focus on development. I mean, it was about 2015, 2016. So there was five years of, we didn't really appreciate what we were building. Um, I, I don't think we, we took a step back and really, we were very one dimensional. It was let's send mm -hmm. as many SMSs as possible. It wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. who is our customer and how are we engaging them? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, finding that focus can really make or break your business. So if you're mm -hmm. able to find that focus early on, um, especially before you raise money, um, and then once you raise money, like I said before, like engaging the investors, because now they're stakeholders, whether you like it or not. I mean, they're in right. the business <laughs> and they can make your life difficult or they can make your life very easy. So, um, so really managing them the way you'd manage employees, that you'd manage your customers, because um, they become a very critical piece of what makes the business run. Um, I think those are some of the things that I, you know, I, I think mm -hmm. I, I can highlight. Yeah. Sam, you, you talked about people, so I'm going gonna, gonna to have to start wrapping up over here. You talked about people being a massive piece of this. Um, you've hired many incredible people. You've seen your people, as you mentioned, go on, you know, leave, transition to even build and found different companies. Uh, what's your number one hiring advice uh, for a founder looking to hire or build their team right now? Um, I, I think nothing, nothing ever... Nothing can change just raw intellectual horsepower. Just that, just hire smart people. I, I, for me, that's, mm. that's, that's my best advice. Um, I find that with smart people, they, they're able to navigate any, mm. they're very versatile. They're very, there's a robustness that they bring around, you know, this is not working. Like we need to be, <laughs> we need to go in this direction. It's much easier with people that can actually now internalize the five, ten different factors that mean that what's you know what you're trying to do is not working. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a big one. Um, and then once you hire, I think the first the first few weeks, the first few months are critical. Um, so how you onboard, I think that's very. And I don't know how companies are doing it during COVID. I mean, we didn't hire much last year, so um, mm -hmm. so just that that first impression is so important in terms of how people mm -hmm. then grow within the team. Because if they're not able to form connections, if they don't find, you know, what's their space, like who are they comfortable with, it can all go south mm -hmm. after that. Um, and, you know, and I think that's where some of these cultural fits and all these things start mm -hmm. to come into play. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, number one, just, you know, try and find really smart people and then, um, and then onboard them in a way where they feel like, this is an environment for them and this is somewhere where they can really scale. Mm -hmm. um, we have room for one last question from the audience. Then we're going to have, I, I have a quick fire round for you. Um, so we have Eric Asuma over here. Uh, he says to Sam, what areas do you think are still untapped in Africa, but present the biggest opportunities for growth in the next few years? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think, I think the, a lot of startups early on were in the enterprise space. So, you know, I still feel like there's mm. probably, uh, you know, like proper products being built for enterprise on the continent. So building for enterprise, for example, in the US is very expensive. I mean, the, the kind of the costs, you know, that, you know, the developers, the engineering talent, but then building for enterprise in Africa can be, you know, much cheaper. Um, so I think there is opportunities there. Um, but I think the, the biggest money is probably going to be made in the consumer space. Um, you know, I, I think enterprise is, enterprise is good for, you know, bootstrapped, you know, you, you can, you can like, you can claw your way, but then at scale, it's fantastic because you, you're not doing too much work to maintain a lot of customers who are giving you big checks. Uh, consumer is the opposite. I mean, you constantly have to keep, you know, bringing in new customers and winning them and these, and it's very competitive, but I think given how the, um, especially the infrastructure space is shaping up where things like access to payments, access to communications, uh, data centers, all these things are becoming much more liberalized. I think the consumer space is now going to be huge. Um, and if you think about it, whether it's content, whether it's, you know, I think these are all fintech plays that are going on. I think content is a big space that probably will explode at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if I, was, if I was to really bet on like where the hockey sticks will come from, I'd say 
something in the consumer space, something that now rides on the rails that, um, you know, the fintechs have built, the telcos have, um, and, and really creates amazing experiences that can now bring in, you know, millions of customers. Like what, for example, like, uh, you know, um, like Nala is doing or, you know, some of these apps that are trying to really connect cross-border payments. I think those kinds of plays are probably going to be uh, interesting. And they were not possible two, three, four years ago, but then now they're becoming much and much more uh, viable. They become possible because of players like you that enable it to be easy for us to connect or just get started in some market. So like, you know, if, pe- if people like you guys and the work you guys do didn't exist, it'd be much, much harder. And that's why I personally, I truly believe it's, it's never been easier to build a tech company at scale in Africa, but it's also really hard because these people who have laid the pipes and the infrastructure have all this stuff they have to deal with that exactly. nobody has any of these ideas. And we're like, yo, why is this down? And you're like, you know how much <laughs> stuff we have to deal with back here? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Sam, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. As, as everybody said, this is my first time meeting Sam uh, in front of you. So like, this is the first time we've chatted as well. Uh, for all those in the audience who've tuned in, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time, especially for those who keep coming back every single week, you know, 40, 50, 60 different people tuning in. So really appreciate your time. Um, you know, for us at Nala, as Naji mentioned at the beginning, it's such an exciting day for us. We just got our approval from the FCA, uh, which is equivalent of the central bank in the UK, uh, to go live. And so that was something we were waiting for and waiting for and waiting for. We just got that this, uh, you know, right before this call. And so we wanted to share that with everybody here. We also are looking for Kenyan test users in, U- in the UK. We have lots of Tanzanians. Uh, we, we really love some more Kenyans and Ugandans in the UK. So if you are Kenyan or Ugandan in the UK, please uh, reach out to us. We'd love your help. And just starting to test stuff, um, as Sam knows, you know, if you don't test it enough before, it, it, when it breaks, it will break really bad. So we want to make sure we provide the safest uh, and most reliable payments from the UK to Eastern Africa as well.